Hello people, in this video we want to look at the top priority questions in ENT. Okay, let's start with the ear. Okay, in ear what now you have? Cholesteatoma is very important. What is cholesteatoma? Guys? It is the presence of keratinizing squamous epithelium in middle ear or mastoid that, uh, that becomes cholesteatoma. Do you know how it grows? This is how it grows. Okay. So Meniere's disease also very important. What is Meniere's disease? Endolymphatic hydrops. There will be vertigo, fluctuating hearing loss, uh, tinnitus then and sense of pressure in the involved ear. So Meniere's disease fully you read about. When uh, otosclerosis, otospongiosis is very important. Guys, otospongiosis is a better terminology for otosclerosis. Here what and all you will see Kahart's notch etc. Here the stapes will be uh, fixed, isn't it? So there will be a dip at 2000 hertz in bone conduction, Kahart's notch. Again, this is an important topic. Then anatomy of middle ear cleft is important. Middle ear cleft, guys, um, do you remember this? We have in the anatomy of the ear, we have covered middle ear cleft. It has middle ear, eustachian tube, antrum aditus, uh, mastoid air cells. That is middle ear cleft. The next important topic is Rene's test. Rene's test is what? It's a tuning fork test. Right, uh, so we have covered Rene's test where you are checking bone conduction and then the air conduction. Air conduction should be longer and louder. Uh, so Rene's test is one test where you, if you are positive, you can be a little happy because normal people will get Rene's test as positive. That is air conduction will be longer, louder. Next topic is conductive deafness and they can ask you the causes in a like a 15 year old girl, right? So conductive um, in types of hearing loss, we have seen that uh, there will be so many types of hearing loss in that they are asking only about conductive hearing loss. And here we want acquired causes because it's a 15 year go old girl, let's say. So in external ear, there could be a tumor, right guys? Uh, are you focusing? So because it is conductive hearing loss, loss right? So uh, it can be external ear, there can be a tumor, etc. Middle ear, what and all can be there? Uh, rupture of the tympanic membrane, there could be a disruption of the ossicles, there could be a mass in the middle ear, fluid in the middle ear, uh, trauma, cholesteatoma could have grown, eustachian tube could have got blocked, otosclerosis, tympanosclerosis, adhesive otitis media. These are all the causes of conductive hearing loss. The next important topic for you will be this one, mal malignant otitis externa. Malignant otitis externa, we have seen in the otitis externa video. Malignant otitis externa, necrotizing otitis externa, it is because of pseudomonas infection in elderly diabetics or uh, immunocompromised. Granulation tissue at junction of cartilaginous and bony. And there's some gallium 67, technetium 99. What is that? That's actually for diagnosis. Guys, uh, we are not going into the details. We're just superficially telling you one or two points about it. Okay. Uh, you have to look at the complete videos on this. Accurative, superative, otitis media, they need uh, ASOM, right? Uh, treatment, uh, everything else they want to know about it. Acute, superative, otitis media. Uh, then coming to otitis externa. Otitis externa, what is affected in otitis externa, guys? Uh, the external ear canal, right? So it could be infective, where we already saw the malignant otitis media. The, that infective could be because of bacteria, fungi, virus. Or it could be because of reactive, uh, there could be eczematous otitis externa, seborrhoic ex otitis externa, neurodermatitis, primary cholesteatoma can be there. So this we have already seen in the otitis externa video. Okay. Then one more topic guys, how is it, what are we looking at? We are looking at top priority questions in ENT, uh, and now in the year we are. Acute coalescent mastoiditis, where is So acute mastoiditis, inflammation of the mucosal lining of antrum and mastoid air cell system is an invariable accompaniment of acute otitis media. The term mastoiditis is used when infection spreads from the mucosa, which is lining the mastoid air cells, to involve the bony walls. So if the bony walls of the mastoid is affected, then only it is called as this acute mastoiditis. Here they are talking about the causes, pathology, then they are talking about the signs, etc. Then Bell's palsy, important guys, Bell's palsy. Facial paralysis, they have shown here. If it is on the left side, what and all are affected. There is loss of wrinkle, there is a wide palpebral fissure, epiphora, absence of nasolabial fold, drooping of the angle of the mouth, right? There are no wrinkles here. Wide palpebral fissure, epiphora, watering, watering, absence of the nasolabial fold, it's absent, then drooping of the angle of mouth. Then hearing aids, important guys, in hearing aids, what and all are there? You have the conventional uh, hearing aids, uh, conventional hearing aids. Actually, under hearing aids, you have conventional, then bone anchored, then implantable hearing aids. Uh, uh, hearing aids, only this much is there, okay? But other than hearing aids, you have something else, some other technology like cochlear implants, uh, brainstem implant, etc., okay? Here they are showing some hearing aids. Body-worn hearing aid. This is a body-worn hearing aid. This is a behind the ear type this is a spectacle type of hearing aid in the ear type of hearing aid bone anchored hearing aid baha 
then you have implantable hearing aids they are showing something here vibrant sound bridge middle ear implant something is there in the middle ear floating mass transducer okay and this is another one components of the vibrating auricular prosthesis vorp then guys we are moving on to the next important question in the ear uh, are you getting it we are looking at the ear main questions so important priority referred otalgia is important why will there be ear pain we have looked at uh, referred otalgia it can be because of the uh fifth cranial nerve that is the fifth cranial nerve because of the teeth and because of the temporomandibular joint because of the anterior two thirds of the tongue all that can be because of the fifth nerve because of the uh, cervical spine spinal nerve 2 uh, and 3 they have told and then um, what else because of uh, cranial nerve 9 9 is glossopharyngeal so base of tongue tonsils elongated styloid process can lead to uh, again ear pain then coming to the 10th cranial nerve you have the vallecula uh, pyriform fossa or larynx can be the causes uh, in 10th nerve those are the important ear questions guys second priority you can give to these let us move on to the second priority in ear itself okay we're still in ear okay don't forget so uh, in this theories of hearing guys theories of hearing what and all you know the traveling wave theory do you know this one uh tono topical mapping and here you have the low frequency at this end right one bekesi traveling wave theory on all that you should know then coming to tympanometry tympanogram this is assessment of hearing chapter in this uh, we have already seen right tympanometry comes under this uh, objective test it is under impedance audiometry tympanometry and acoustic <coughs> reflex these two come under this impedance audiometry what do they do in tympanometry some uh, something like this and they draw a tympanogram like this right then moving on ototoxic drugs important hearing loss uh, chapter ototoxic drugs we have already looked at this uh, various drugs can be uh, bad aminoglycoside antibiotics can be bad to us then diuretics can be bad analgesics also can be bad antimalarial cytotoxic drugs all these are going to be bad okay these are cytotoxic Sorry, auto toxic. Then coming to sudden hearing loss causes and management. They are asking where is that? That also we have looked at, right? Sudden hearing loss causes infection, mumps, mumps. Don't forget trauma, vac vascular, Meniere's disease, toxics, uh, toxins, toxic, neoplasms, etc. Psychogenic also sudden hearing loss. Management also is we have looked at. Okay. Then let us go to fistula test. Fistula test also we have seen. Where is fistula test? So fistula test if uh, it is bad if it is positive that means you are able to transmit the pressure uh, to the labyrinth so there will be nystagmus and vertigo so but a positive fistula can also uh, mean that the labyrinth is still functioning so that's the, that's the only good thing there otomycosis guys organisms and uh, management otomycosis is where So you will blame aspergillus niger aspergillus fumigatus candida albicans all this you will blame and they will cause otomycosis treatment they have written nistat in here you can read more about this okay then coming to keratosis obturans uh, this is coming under diseases of external ear so keratosis obturans uh, yeah we have looked at this um, desquamated epithelial cells pearly white deep meatus uh, this is external ear canal right okay you have to read this then complications of csom they have asked we have looked at this complications of csom uh, otitis media complications you have infratemporal uh, mastoiditis petrositis um, facial paralysis labyrinthitis then you have intracranial extradural abscess uh, subdural abscess meningitis vein abscess thrombophlebitis otitic hydrocephalus so yes those are the complications then great nigo syndrome important this is also a complication of otitis media it's coming under that chapter let's look at this um, great nigo syndrome ear discharge will be there diplopia because of the this is sixth right sixth nerve paralysis then uh, retro orbital pain because of the fifth nerve okay otological causes for facial paralysis where is this otological causes for facial paralysis we have seen this otological causes of facial nerve paralysis acute otitis media cholesteatoma mastoid mastoid cavity infection malignant otitis externa non cholesteatomous chronic suppurative otitis media tuberculous mastoiditis suppurative parotitis chronic granulomatosis etc etc guys that is important then cochlear impl implant also important 
here are some cochlear implants nuclear cochlear implant advanced bionics cochlear implant system so these are the uh, all the priority questions in ear we are done with important questions of ear guys we will look at nose uh, in the next video okay bye bye hello people we are looking at the priority questions in e n t right we have finished ear now we will move on to nose the priority questions in nose are osteomyetal complex what is this osteomyetal complex guys this one where all the uh, sinuses are coming together and draining into the middle meatus isn't it what can you see here maxillary sinus ethmoidal infundibulum inferior turbinate uncinate process middle turbinate bulla ethmoid dalis uh, etc etc so you'll have to draw this probably so which are the three sinuses guys maxillary sinus anterior ethmoidal air cells and frontal sinus they are saying then guys the next important priority topic is under nasal septum septal perforation you should know so there could be many causes for septal perforation as a fix you can remember the uh, sialistic button sep uh, septal button etc okay lot of other fixes are also there then coming to atrophic rhinitis guys atrophic rhinitis is uh, also called as ozaina it is a chronic rhinitis basically it is uh, characterized by the atrophy of the nasal mucosa and the turbinate bones right so it will be very airy right it will be completely open kind of a nasal cavity there will be foul smelling crust but the person himself will be unaware of it this is all because of klebsiella ozaina and many other causes this is called also as merciful anosmia because the person himself is not aware of the smell rhinolith is an important topic guys stone formation in nasal cavity rhinolith uh, should know about this and how will you treat it you will just remove it under general anesthesia etc next important topic epistaxis so basically it can be because of kaiselbach's plexus which is at little area or it can be posterior because of the woodruff's plexus so anyway so this is um, epistaxis the causes can be local general idiopathic could be hypertension etc this is the trotters method you make the patient sit up and uh, bend forward so that the blood doesn't go backwards and he should not uh, swallow it right that is the whole intention okay then coming to rhinoscleroma this is because of klebsiella rhinoscleromatis it is bacterial rhinoscleroma granulomatous disease of nose it is because of klebsiella rhinoscleromatis okay then uh, let's move on to the next question rhinosporidiosis that is a fungal cause isn't it rhinosporidiosis is fungal it is subcutaneous mycosis it is caused by rhinosporidium seaberry large friable polyps again this is chronic granulomatous disease because of fungi okay next question is uh, cerebrospinal fluid rhinorrhea csf rhinorrhea leakage of the csf into the nose is called csf rhinorrhea this may be clear or it could be mixed with blood these are the sites of leakage frontal sinus ethmoid sinus pinoid sinus eustachian tube in cases of temporal bone fracture look at the differences between um, a csf fluid and a nasal secretion a csf fluid will be clear it will be thin watery and clear and uh, a few drops will come in nasal secretion it will be continuous kind of thick secretion isn't it and that nasal secretion can be sniffed back and uh, when it comes to csf you can see that the beta transferrin will always be present it's specific for csf beta transferrin csf beta transferrin csf the next question is vasomotor rhinitis because it is non allergic form of rhinitis you'll have to rule out all the other causes of uh, allergic rhinitis so what do you do in this case you will uh, avoid sudden change give antihistamines uh, histaminics uh, give topical steroids systemic steroids etc and uh, you will surgically check if there is any nasal obstruction that can be relieved polyp deviated nasal septum etc etc they want to also section the parasympathetic secretory motor fibers vidian neurectomy then this one the next question that's important under epistaxis little area kaisel black plexus we all, we already have seen this right under epistaxis so this uh, in epistaxis there can be two post anterior posterior this is the anterior one in anterior do uh, you have this little area where you have the kaisel black plexus what are all arteries anterior ethmoidal artery here you have some facial artery here you have greater palatine and here you have spino palatine artery these are the four you should know the nasal bone fracture guys nasal bone fracture it can be depressed or angulated depressed means from front somebody punched that person so it got depressed angulated means from side somebody pushed so it became angulated uh, how do you fix it closed fixing or uh, closed fixing initially you can do uh, if you miss that then you will have to go for open uh, uh, fixing that is you will have to open up okay 
Okay, the last priority question in the nose, not last high priority question in nose is this FESS, functional endoscopic sinus surgery. There's a whole chapter on this. So, what are the indications for an endoscopic sinus surgery? The indications are all the sinusitis, remember, okay, bacterial sinusitis, recurrent acute bacterial sinusitis, polypoid rhinosinusitis, fungal rhinosinus, rhinosinusitis. Then you have anthracoanal polyp, that is a nasal polyp, that is because of the maxillary sinus, isn't it? Mucosal of the frontoethmoid or the sphenoid sinus, so a mucosal you can remember. Control of epistaxis by endoscopic cautery, you want to do cautery for this uh, epistaxis. Removal of foreign body you can do with endoscopic uh, sinus surgery, then endoscopic septoplasty. Okay. General anesthesia is preferred, they are saying. Anyway, sir, contraindications are there. Uh, these are very general contraindications only. Inexperience uh, in proper instrument, disease inaccessible, osteomyelitis, if the person has, you should not do. Threatened intracranial or intraorbital complications, then don't do. This is some site of injection just anterior to the uncinate process on the lateral wall of the right side of nose. Okay, okay, that site was for in uh, injection of the lignocaine. Okay. 1% lignocaine with 1 is to 1 lakh adrenaline. In this FESS rate, there are two surgical techniques, anterior to posterior and then posterior to anterior some, something. Okay. Guys, in nose, we have finished the high priority. Now, let us look at the second in line. These are the medium priority, you can see. Like olfactory area, uh, physiology of nose, guys. Do you know uh, olfactory area? Look at this. This is the nose, then that place if you zoom something like this and this will be the olfactory uh, cilia, olfactory membrane, olfactory cells, some sustentacular supporting cells, Bowman's gland, cribriform plate of ethmoid bone, glomerulos, glomerulus, then here you have the has granule cells this has granule cell inhibitors olfactory bulb you have mitral cell olfactory tract okay then olfactory nerve you should mention so some order will come then g protein complex adenyl cyclase c amp from atp c amp open sodium channelized channels depolarize the membrane so in the brain you have some medial olfactory area lateral olfactory area okay the next high priority is rhinopyma. Then uh, rhinopyma, you should know, guys. Rhinopyma. This one. Basically, potato tumor, hypertrophy of the sebaceous glands. Okay, unsightly appearance. This is a benign condition anyways, rhinopyma. Then nasal miasis, myiasis. Nasal myiasis. Maggots in the nose. Flies. Chrysomyia, that's why the name myiasis, right? Look at these images, very gross, right? Maggot nose. Then coanal atresia, this is again, uh, what is this? Coanal atresia, persistence of bucco nasal membrane, absence of air bubbles, methylene blue. Okay, this is basically a film, right, in the, <clears throat> in the back of the nose, right? So, that is coenal atresia, persistence of the buccal membrane. Then coming to rhinitis medicamentosa. Because people who use these decongestants more than the prescribed, na, they will develop this rebound phenomena. Okay, so all the turbinates will undergo hypertrophy, isn't it? That is rhinitis medicamentosa. That is coming under this vasomotor and other forms of non-allergic rhinitis. That is coming. Then ethmoidal polyposis. In this nasal polyp chapter, you have seen anterior and posterior. In that posterior, it is ethmoidal polyposis, right? See, under nasal polyp, you have anthrocoanal polyp and bilateral ethmoidal polyp. This bilateral ethmoidal polyp is important. How do you differentiate this ethmoidal polyp from anthrocoanal polyp? This will be multiple bilateral. They are coming from ethmoidal sinus and uh, they may grow anteriorly and they may present in the nerves. They are usually small and grape-like. What else? These are growing anteriorly, remember. Ethmoidal polyp. Next question here, they are interested in this unilateral nasal mass uh, differential diagnosis they want to know. So, in unilateral causes of nasal obstruction, basically, if it is a mass, then what will it be? It can be all that polyp, right? Anthrocoanal polyps, etc. So, these are the causes in that you will have to find the mass and right because they have asked masses only. Then coming to leaf fault fractures of maxilla, that's also important question. 
so this is leafot fracture guys a is here b is here and c is here so you should know why they are a b c okay so we have finished the priority questions in nose guys so let's continue nose over guys so ear over nose over next we have to continue with oral cavity then pharynx then larynx okay so people now let us continue uh, we have finished ear right ear uh, mcqs i'm uh, sorry ear uh, important questions we saw nose important questions we saw now we will move on to oral cavity okay so in oral cavity ranula is very important guys so this ranula is coming under the tumors of oral cavity right that is the chapter tumors of oral cavity so let's look at that so this is a uh, ranula guys this is a ranula what is it what is a ranula now? it is a cystic translucent lesion in the floor of the mouth okay on one side of the frenulum and pushing the tongue so it pushes the tongue up it arises from the sublingual salivary gland okay sublingual salivary gland remember because the ducts get obstructed so there is a cystic translucent lesion some ranula extend into the neck plunging so in benign tumors you have solid cystic this is a cystic lesion so sublingual gland is uh, affected this is ranula note the translucent swelling under the tongue one side the next important question for you in oral cavity is the common disorder of oral cavity oral submucous fibrosis osf is oral submucous fibrosis it's a chronic insidious pro process characterized by juxta epithelial deposition of fibrous tissue in oral cavity and pharynx because of the saracenate uh, and uh, tobacco chewing guys palm chew submucous fibrosis note the blanched appearance of the soft palate and fusel pillars marked trismus due to submucous fibrosis marked trismus means what locked jaw so these are the two important questions in uh, oral cavity now we are done with oral cavity guys so after oral cavity what will come ear nose oral cavity now let's move on to pharynx in pharynx guys anatomy and physiology you should know uh, waldeus ring and its importance waldeus ring please so waldeus ring you have adenoid nasopharyngeal tubal tonsils palatine tonsil which is simply called as tonsil and lingual tonsils waldeus ring then it's the next question juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma jna this is a tumor of nasopharynx juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma jna in this uh, we have already seen it is testosterone dependent right so it is seen in adolescent males in the second decade of life okay so what will happen here they will have recurrent epistaxis right that is jna juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma it is the it's a rare tumor it's the commonest of all benign tumors of nasopharynx it's common but rare okay The next question important in pharynx is Ludwig's angina that is coming under head and neck space infections. Ludwig angina. This is something to do with the submandibular space, guys. So submandibular space, you can see how it is affected here. Ludwig's angina in a seven-year-old child. The next important question here is peritonsillar abscess or quincy. This is also coming under the same chapter, head and neck space infections. See head and neck space infections. Ludwig's angina, peritonsillar abscess, quincy. and another thing is important anyways now look at peritonsillar abscess um, on the left side here yes on the left side they are saying right here they have shown the peritonsillar abscess on the right side right it is pushing this uh, uh, so let's read this peritonsillar abscess site of drainage is just lateral to the junction of the vertical line so they have shown some vertical line here and horizontal line here uh the site of drainage is just lateral to the junction of the vertical line through anterior pillar and horizontal line just lateral to it right they want to do a drainage for the peritonsillar abscess hopefully that's right this is medial right so this should be lateral peritonsillar abscess is a collection of pus in the peritonsillar space which is which lies between the capsule of the tonsil and the superior constrictor muscle where not between the capsule of the tonsil and the superior constrictor muscle so the next important head and neck space infection retropharyngeal abscess very important high priority here they have pointed out to retropharyngeal abscess radiograph of soft tissue lateral view neck showing widening of prevertebral space with gas formation so where is this retropharyngeal space here they have shown here right retropharyngeal space so in this uh, there is a lot you have to know acute uh, retropharyngeal abscess 
and chronic retropharyngeal abscess that is the one they are calling as prevertebral abscess which which was shown here as prevertebral space but this is actually acute itself acute retropharyngeal abscess itself anyways we are done with head and neck space infections right uh, let's move on now to the uh, just a few more left acute and chronic tonsillitis white patch membrane on tonsil differential diagnosis see white patch membrane on tonsil it can be diphtheria okay but anyways they want differential diagnosis so lot of white patches can be possible as we are moving on to this one adenoid facies this is coming under adenoids and other inflammations of nasopharynx look at this adenoid facies patient is a mouth breather so if the adenoid tonsils are big uh, there is adenoid facies chronic nasal obstruction and mouth breathing leading to characteristic facial appearance called adenoid facies the child has elongated face with dull expression open mouth prominent and crowded upper teeth and hitched up upper lip the nose gives a pinched in appearance due to disuse atrophy of the alanaceae hard palate in these cases is high, highly arched so everything they have given there okay let's move on to pyriform sinus fossa this is anatomy and physiology again 287 Here they are showing the normal pyriform fossa left and right. Right and left they show better when patient phonates. So here they are cannot show video. So they have just shown left. Sorry, this is right and this is left, right? So this is these are the vocal cords. What do you say? So there, okay. So in the hypopharynx, that is the laryngopharynx, you have pyriform sinus or fossa. It lies either side of the larynx and extends from the pharyngo epiglottic fold to the upper end of the esophagus to the upper end of the esophagus it is there it is bounded laterally by the thyrohyoid membrane and the thyroid cartilage and medially by the array epiglottic fold posterior lateral lateral surfaces of arytenoid and cricoid cartilages okay what is this image yeah the same thing okay pyriform fossa mainly you can remember foreign bodies may lodge in the pyriform fossa an internal laryngeal nerve is there here okay that's it it forms the lateral channel for food last question guys here in pharynx which we consider top priority that is in tonsillitis cardinal signs of chronic tonsillitis so in chronic tonsillitis you have chronic follicular tonsillitis chronic parenchymatous tonsillitis chronic fibroid tonsillitis here they are showing parenchymatous tonsillitis Look at the clinical features: recurrent attack of sore throat, acute tonsillitis, chronic irritation in the throat with cough, bad taste in mouth, foul breath, halitosis is foul breath due to pus in the crepts, thick speech, difficulty in swallowing, choking spells at night when tonsils are large and obstructive. So these are the features of chronic tonsillitis, which they want you to know. Cardinal signs of chronic tonsillitis. So we are done with pharynx now. So ear, nose, oral cavity, pharynx done. All these four are done. Still, what is left? Larynx is left. Then we'll have to look at some other uh, things, small, small things. Okay. Guys, now let us move on to the priority questions from larynx. Okay. Tracheostomy is important. Tracheostomy procedure for airway is important. Uh, in indications. There are so many types of tracheostomy, like emergency tracheostomy, elective, permanent, precutaneous, mini tracheostomy. basically it is going to give an alternate path for breathing so uh, indications are respiratory obstruction retained secretions respiratory insufficiency what are the indications respiratory obstruction like acute epiglottis trauma foreign body tumors retained secretions means what and all you will have painful cough a spasm of the respiratory muscles tetanus right coma respiratory insufficiency like encephal emphysema bronchiectasis atelectasis the next important question in larynx is stridor the congenital lesions <clears throat> of larynx and stridor stridor basically is uh, you have to give the types the definition so stridor is what noise res, uh, noise during respiration because of narrow airway because of turbulent air flow so if it is above the glottis it's going to be uh, inspiratory stridor if it is below the glottis it is going to be expiratory stridor so inspiratory expiratory in the middle if there is any problem it will have both features biphasic it will be to be there during both the times right so uh, this is types of causes of stridor congenital will be laryngomalacia laryngeal web uh, etc then uh, acquired will be foreign body uh, then uh, papillomas etc then you have in this acquired they have divided as feb afebrile and febrile 
there are a lot more reasons please look at that okay then coming to ep acute epiglottitis this is coming in acute and chronic inflammation of the larynx acute epiglottitis you should know so basically acute epiglottitis or supraglottic laryngitis this is because of hem hemophilus influenzae b they are saying okay the epiglottis will be swollen and red it will be um, a thumb sign in x-ray now coming to benign tumors of larynx guys in this vocal nodules important singers nodules they are also called as these will be bilateral and small dots kind of a thing anterior one third uh, posterior two third uh, between that right that there you will have vocal nodule uh, then you can see here these are bilateral just like dots these are vocal nodules how will vocal polyps be vocal polyps will be unilateral and they will be in the same place and they will be uh, flopping up and down they will be unilateral and they will be little large than these nodules right that will be vocal polyp so vocal uh, po cord polyp also very important then you have the papilloma larynx juvenile laryngeal papillomatosis this is because of human papilloma virus this is also very important this is a benign tumor only this is basically in juveniles also it can be it can be in adults also in juveniles it will be recurrent you remove how much of it will keep coming back uh, in adults it won't come back it will be single and smaller in adults so adults you can manage but juvenile the problem is they keep recurring and they are large in size and multiple etc so that was about the human because of human papilloma virus then coming to larynx difference between adult and infant this we have seen in separate video right uh, so basically the uh, child's larynx would be higher up and uh, what else the tongue will be large in relationship to the mouth the uh, narrowest part will be the cricoid cartilage it will be more like a funnel shaped in a child and in may uh, in adults it will be a cylindrical shape right so that's what we have seen so what are all differences we have seen position the cartilages are very soft in child so they can collapse they will have epiglottis like omega that can cause laryngomalacia right the thyroid cartilage is going to be flat right then uh, what else vocal folds are going to be smaller in length so after this question the next question they are interested in is rhine case edema this is again in acute and chronic inflammations of larynx the rhine case edema we have seen this one right rhine case edema you can see in smokers they will have this uh, spindle shaped transparent kind of a membrane right in the space of rhine case so polypoid degeneration of vocal cord can happen because of this so we have seen in this some word called transparent or something wait pale translucent look yes fusiform swellings with pale translucent look the next most important question in larynx will be laryngomalacia congenital laryngeal stridor so this one we have seen there will be a very floppy a uh, flaccid epiglottis which will be like omega shape so there will be strider this will be inspiratory strider so this is a congenital lesion of the larynx not this one guys we are looking at laryngomalacia okay congenital laryngeal strider so in this we saw that uh, there is excessive flaccidity of the supraglottic larynx strider increases on crying and it will decrease if you put the child in prone position this uh, usually disappears by itself by age of 2 because uh, the cartilages will become a little less flaccid so these are the high priority topics in larynx so people we are looking at ent important questions now let us look at some miscellaneous things like thyroid gland lingual thyroid is very important look at this uh, lingual thyroid uh, the arrow is indicating that and a ct scan sagittal view of the same so here they are saying it may be only thyroid tissue or uh, be present in addition to normal thyroid or an ectopic thyroid it causes airway obstruction or difficulty to swallow it is seen at as a mass at the base of the tongue on indirect laryngoscopy it should be differentiated from other masses so the thyroid is up much up so that was about thyroid now let us move on to everything else in ent guys laser surgery what does laser stand for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation so you will stimulate you will uh, em, the radiations will get emitted light amplified by this okay you remember carbon dioxide laser their nd yag laser lot of types of lasers are if of effect of laser you will reflect or you transmit or you scatter or you absorb with the tissue destruction many types of laser guys still are there argon laser also is remember that also okay argon laser. in ear they are using this argon ktp carbon dioxide yag laser yes so many things you have to know here then uh, what exactly are in it laser defined types applications you should know Okay, then uh, let's move on. In uh, clinical methods, 
<clears throat> neck masses you should know thyroglossal cyst guys then midline swellings branchial cyst all these three are coming in the same thing right neck masses so neck masses you have this thyroglossal duct cyst so you should know all the midline swellings and this thyroglossal duct cyst is a midline swelling guys and what about branchial cyst that is coming here you can see branchial cyst is coming in the lateral swellings of neck and in the anterior triangle lastly guys some miscellaneous topics here tracheostomy tubes you should know example this is fuller's tracheostomy tube this is jackson's tracheostomy tube this is some cuffed tracheostomy tube this is some cuffed suction aid suction aid cuffed suction aid tracheostomy tube then rigid esophagoscopy esophagoscopy can be rigid or flexible fiber optic or transnasal in rigid esophagoscopy uh, what are the indications uh, dysphagia uh retrosternal burning hemet emesis uh, secondary neck with unknown primary it can also be therapeutic uh, remove foreign body dilatation in case of esophageal stricture cardiac achalachia endoscopic removal of benign lesions uh, insertion of some tube is it injection of esophageal varices they expect us to know the contraindications also trismus you cannot uh, lock jaw disease of cervical spine receding mandible aneurysm of aorta for fear of rupture fatal hemorrhage advanced heart liver kidney disease that was about rigid esophagoscopy uh, myringotomy you are incising the tympanic membrane with the purpose to drain something okay so when will you do this if there is some otitis media with effusion with our um, acute suppurative otitis media aero otitis media atelectatic ear grommet is inserted here you are making the hole sometimes you need to close the hole that will become myringoplasty now let us look at this one coalescent mastoiditis for which you will do cortical mastoidectomy so this is called a simple or complete mastoidectomy or schwartz operation cortical mastoidectomy so this is cortical mastoidectomy the posterior meatal wall is left intact so that is done for mastoiditis right coalescent mastoiditis diagnostic nasal endoscopy diagnostic nasal endoscopy so basically you will use this for diagnosis of any disease of the nose or the uh, what is pns paranasal sinus diagnose source of bleeding in epistaxis so you going into the nose for what and all where you go treat some sort same thing there precise biopsy from nose and nasopharynx nose 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 nasal sinus etc this pns sometimes can mean peripheral nervous system they should write it properly just like uh, rigid uh, esophagoscopy you have rigid bronchoscopy also that is also important rigid bronchoscopy you uh, the uh, indications will be so they are asking you indications contraindications complications so indications will be find out the cause of wheezing hemoptysis if when chest x ray shows some opacity atelectasis em, obstructive emphysema hilar or mediastinal shadows vocal cord palsy collection of bronchial secretions uh, for you will use it to collect some collect the secretion okay therapeutic to remove foreign body to remove retain secretions tonsillectomy so why will you do tonsillectomy absolute indications so recurrent infections of the throat peritonsillar abscess tonsillitis hypertrophy of tonsils which uh, are going to obstruct the airway difficulty in swallowing interferes with the speech then there's a suspicion of malignancy in all these cases they'll just remove tonsillectomy dangerous area of face guys you know right if this is face and this is nose and this is mouth so they are calling this as the dangerous area of face right so it can take the the what those veins are called from the facial vein it will go to deep facial vein to the pterygoid venous plexus to the emissary vein to the cavernous sinus remember facial vein emissary vein cavernous sinus okay then nasal decongestants what have you studied in pharmacology do you remember those uh, nasal decongestants phenylephrine oxymetazolin nafazolin xylometazolin pseudoephedrine phenylpropanolamine at least some names you can remember and remember if you uh, abuse this what will it cause medical mentosa medico no it's medica mentosa rhinitis medica mentosa the hypertrophy of the turbinates that's rebound phenomena if they are abused uh, longer than they should be They should, if they are used longer than they should be so this completes all the top priority questions in ent all the best bye bye